Always an asteroid. So, always an asteroid. Well, they're sometimes referred to as minor planets, and this is a very important distinction to dwarf planets. So, dwarf planets are things like, yes, Pluto, not argue, Ceres, things like that. Uh, and then minor planets are then the kind of lumpy, misshapen, sometimes almost spherical potatoes that are asteroids. And in one sentence, an asteroid is a rocky or metallic or sometimes rocky and metallic fragment left over from the solar system's formation four and a half billion years ago. So the largest is nearly <laughs> spherical, like two palace. That one is, is nearly spherical. Otherwise, they are basically potatoes is the best way to think about it. They can be hundreds of uh, kilometers across they can be just a few tens of kilometers in diameter or they can go down to basically tiny little stones that's when we start saying well where do you draw the line between asteroids and then basically rubble so yeah it's kind of a continuum with all these small bodies in the solar system where you have grains of sand which are making up your meteor showers you know as those are burning up through the atmosphere right up through then bits of rock up to your smallest asteroids then your dwarf planets, and then of course your actual planets. If they're rocky um, in that sort of category, then they'll be made of like clay and silicates, things like that. If they're metallic, it's mostly nickel and iron. Those are the metals. Of course, they do also contain some of the precious metals. This is why in the future, asteroid mining might be a quite lucrative business. But by and large, you're looking at nickel and iron. Now, they do orbit the sun um, in one way or another, typically on elliptical orbits, quite kind of kamikaze orbits because they're heavily influenced by the larger bodies in the solar system. Like everything in the solar system as well, they do rotate in some sort of sense, but really rather than a nice new rotation like planet Earth has or any of the other planets in the solar system, it's more like erratic tumbling, so they're not necessarily uniformly spinning um, or looking pretty about it while they're doing it. You can get um, double or triple systems of asteroids, which is quite nice. You can actually get asteroids that orbit each other. Sometimes you have one system where one asteroid is particularly big compared to the other one, so it's more like an asteroid with a tiny little moon. And uh, the image that we've got on the bottom, well, left, to you guys. Uh, on the left of the left is an actual image of the Dimorphos Didymos system, which I'm going to come to towards the end of these slides. And then on the right is a kind of artist's impression of what we think. And this is a classic like asteroid with a moonlet orbiting it kind of system. But by and large, asteroids are mostly on their own rather than being in a binary system or a triple system or having a tiny little moon. Uh, some terminology which is definitely worth going through because all of these words can kind of get mixed up when you're thinking about small bits of rock up in space. So an asteroid is your leftover debris from the formation of the solar system, rocky metallic, natural space junk is one way to think about it. But a meteor is when a little bit of that space junk is actively burning up in the atmosphere. So something can be an asteroid for maybe billions of years and it'll be a meteor for a few seconds. A meteorite is whatever makes it to the ground on Earth and survives. And then a meteoroid is something that could become a meteor in the future. A meteoroid we don't use so much, but yeah, those are the kind of definitions between an asteroid, meteor, meteorite. I guess one kind of division between meteoroid and asteroid is your asteroid will cover anything up to hundreds of kilometres. Really, you don't want one of those becoming a meteor, that would be <laughs> bad. But then a meteoroid will be your kind of small pebbles, your tiny little bits and bobs. In terms of uh, discovery, uh, discovery of asteroids will go all the way back to kind of the late 18th century. This is where the story starts with the now disproved Titius Bone Law. Um, it is really just a mathematical curiosity, but at the time, uh, someone who was doing some very clever mathematics, some people were, well, Titius and Bone, were uh, doing some maths and they figured out that there's a curious mathematical law which predicts the spacing of planets in the solar system really quite accurately. 
So the prediction is uh, the red line, the blue line is uh, the actual distance between the planets. And you can see as we get out to the outer solar system where we've got Uranus and Neptune, this starts to break down. However, at that point, we didn't have Uranus and Neptune. So as far as all the astronomers of the time, in the late 18th century were concerned, they were like, oh God, like this law is brilliant. And then when Herschel discovered Uranus in 1781, and it fit almost exactly where this Titus Bode law was predicting there to be another planet, people were like, oh my God, like this law is amazing. We're gonna find another planet and we're gonna find another planet in between Mars and Jupiter, because this is what this law was saying, that there should be something in between Mars and Jupiter, which hadn't been found. And so it, that's what really sparked the hunt for something in between those two planets. So in 1801, Giuseppe Piazzi, he found Ceres at this predicted location, roughly in between Mars and Jupiter. But in 940 kilometers across, they were like, it's too small to be a planet, why is it huge? Like, what is that to be a rebel? Over the subsequent years, more of these kind of small bodies were found at this location between Mars and Jupiter, where the Titus Bode law was predicting them to be found. So you've got Pallas and Juno and Vesta, all of them smaller than the first body that had been found between Mars and Jupiter. You can sort of see them to scale with the moon there. In 1802, Herschel, because you know he hadn't got his finger in enough pies, decided to <laughs> coin the term asteroid to be something that was like star-like and star-shaped and reflecting to the star-like appearance of these tiny bodies because at the time you know they were too small to be resolved into anything. That's where the word asteroid comes from. In 1845 then another body was found, Astraea, and so at this point where they're starting to collect numerous of these small bodies existing between Mars and Jupiter, they actually realize that there is no missing planet between Mars and Jupiter. There is actually this ring of debris, which is now we recognize to be the main asteroid belt. So this is where the journey of discovery for asteroids began. Now, most of the known asteroids, they lie in the main asteroid belt and the amount of mass in the main asteroid belt is tiny. It's just a few percent of the mass of the moon. And yet there are between one and two million asteroids over one kilometer in diameter in the main asteroid belt. So that's all the big ones. There are many hundreds of millions of smaller bodies in this main asteroid belt. But despite this, the main asteroid belt is very, very easy to traverse. It's not, you know, when you watch all of the sci-fi films and they're all like dodging all the asteroids and they're, oh my God, we're going to be hit, you know, look out off the starboard bow. No, that was crap. Because we send all of our deep space probes through the main asteroid belt all the time. But the very first one to go through the main asteroid belt was Pioneer 10. It was about 50 years ago. And they didn't know whether it was actually going to make it or not. That was one of the big risks of the mission. They were like, can we actually go through the main asteroid belt or is it going to get smashed to some greens? But yeah, they're, um, they're very, very widely spaced. I think if you sort of think of it by area rather than volume, if you have an area the size of Wales, uh, you have about six asteroids spaced across the entire of Wales, just to kind of give you an idea of the space in between the, the big asteroids and the main asteroid belt. It's very wide. Uh, the main asteroid belt is sitting between Mars and Jupiter it has the same width as Earth's orbit around the Sun. So it, it's huge, it's a huge, huge area, but really very sparsely populated. Had Jupiter not been the gas giant planet that it is, then we actually may have had a ninth planet at the location of the main asteroid belt. And that is because Jupiter is so massive its gravity is so influential that gravitational perturbation, so gravitational nudges from Jupiter prevented all of that rubble left over from planetary formation to form another planet. And computer simulations have shown us that all of these extra nudges from Jupiter, instead of allowing all of these bits to coagulate together, they actually ended up smashing together, changing their trajectories and actually being yeeted out of the solar system for good. The solar system and the, uh, 
the main asteroid belt is not this kind of uniform distribution of asteroids. There's actually resonances in there. So like the rings of Saturn, you've got gaps, regions which are more dense. The main asteroid belt has lots of structure like this as well, and most of it is because of influences by Jupiter. But the other planets do get involved as well. So beyond the main asteroid belt, uh, another significant region of asteroids are the Jupiter Trojans. And the Jupiter Trojans, they look uh, 60 degrees ahead and behind Jupiter at some gravitationally stable points called the Lagrange point. So these are, you can see a cloud here, and then there's another cloud like around here. And these are the Jupiter Trojans, another place where asteroids sit. These are the Lagrange points, just, just so that you can see where the Lagrange points are. Uh, L4 and L5 are where the Jupiter Trojan sits. So in this diagram, you can imagine we've got the Sun in the middle. Instead of it being Earth, it's Jupiter. L4 and L5 are where the Jupiter Trojan is sitting. L2 is where the James Webb Space Telescope is, in case you're wondering. We know of about 10,000 asteroids sitting at the um, L4 and L5 points of Jupiter but there could be just as many asteroids orbiting around with Jupiter as there are in the main asteroid belt. And just like gravitational nudges from Jupiter influence the distribution in the main asteroid belt, gravitational influ uh, influences from Saturn in particular mean that instead of sitting exactly at these gravitationally stable points, they kind of oscillate around, which is why they're spread out, as you can see on the, on the orbital circle, in like these arc shapes. Love it, history, because it's not just astronomy, I shall come. Uh, they are named for characters in the Iliad and uh, from the Trojan War. L4 has Greek names, L5 has Trojan names, but the first two that were ever discovered um, actually have the opposite names, so they're forever known as spies in the enemy camps. So yeah, that's just like, you can see them, that choice. Where do they come from? We don't know. We're not sure if these are particularly relics left over um, from Jupiter's formation? Have they been captured during planet migration, which happened early on in the solar system formation? Who can say? Beyond the orbit of Neptune then, there's another ring of icy debris, which I'm not gonna talk about too much because it's straying into the territory of comets. And I know where Paul is going because Paul's talk's gonna be about comets. Um, but there is kind of more icy debris beyond the orbit of Neptune. Uh, more, more kind of icy rather than rocky. We know about 2,000 objects, but there's gonna be hundreds of thousands of them out there. Just to kind of highlight how, how full of rubbish our solar system is, really. Then the final kind of asteroids to talk about, I think, are near-Earth asteroids, because these are the ones we care about, right? What's coming close to our home planet? A near-Earth asteroid is uh, anyone that comes within 1.3 AU of Earth, so uh, of the Sun, sorry. So that is, it comes within a third of Earth's orbit around the Sun. Uh, so that that's kind of the limit of near-Earth, so reasonably close. Most, I think, it's very important to highlight that most do not, like, pose a threat to us. You know, there's, there's not going to be an asteroid coming to hit us as much as the newspapers like to think that there is. Most of near-Earth asteroids, they originate from the main asteroid belt. Um, they've just kind of been nudged out of there by gravitational influences from Jupiter um, and also Mars. And also if they've sort of collided with another asteroid in the main asteroid belt, that can disturb their orbits. And then in they'll come to the inner solar system. Now the good news is about near-Earth asteroids, we know about pretty much everything that's a kilometre or bigger. Now, a kilometre or bigger is kind of dinosaur ending event, right? We know about those, that's good. We know of about 25,000, which are 140 metres or bigger. And 140 metres is going to like wipe out your city. Not completely ravage the entire planet, but you know, London's gone sort of thing. Unfortunately, those 25,000 are only about 40% of those city-destroying asteroids out there. So about 60%, well, you know where they are. They're out there somewhere. And then, of course, there are millions, 
hundreds of millions, which are even smaller. And those, yeah, we haven't got a clue about those. But what we really care about are potentially hazardous asteroids. Because just because it can be as close to Earth does not mean it's going to destroy us. And potentially hazardous asteroids are ones that come within about 20 Earth moon distances of Earth's orbit and they're 140 metres across, so that is the kind of city-wide damage level. We know of about 2,000 of these, but only about two dozen of them are closely monitored because actually really there's only about two dozen which have a smidgen of a chance of hitting us within the next 100 years. And by a smidgen of a chance, I mean much, much less than 1%. So the good news is, everything that we know about is fine. But of course, it's the things that we don't know about that are the problem. So should we panic? If you haven't seen this film, by the way, definitely watch it. It's excellent. It's, uh, don't look up on Netflix. But should we panic? The answer is no, never panic. Because actually tonight, uh, NASA are conducting, well, it's actually in partnership um, with the Italian Space Agency as well, their first full-scale planetary defence test. And they will be smashing DART, which is this satellite down at the bottom. This is not for scale, by the way. Um, yeah, <laughs> just thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> well, I think DART is about uh, the size of a washing machine, something like that. Um, and uh, Didymos and Dimorphos, so Didymos is, there's a few hundred kilometers across, so yeah, definitely not scale. But they're gonna be um, smashing DART, the washing machine type satellite, into Dimorphos, which is a moonlet of Didymos, uh, with the aim of trying to change its orbit. So Didymos has a 12 hour orbit around uh, Didymos, and they're gonna try and shorten that orbit by just a few minutes. Um, and it's happening tonight, Unfortunately, not visible for us because it's going to be in the constellation of Fornax, which if you're at lower latitudes, you can see. But it might actually be visible from backyard telescopes. So keep an eye on Twitter because people might be posting about it. Um, but if it works, then should something kind of loom from the dark, this will be our plan because all of the, the films are like, yes, we'll blow the asteroid to smithereens. In order to do that, you need to know the structure, you need to know the composition of your asteroid that you're hitting. We never know what the structure and composition of an asteroid is. Our best bet is to hit it and just hopefully tap it out the way and so it'll just glide back past Earth. So yes, if something does look in the dark, we will be fine. And that's asteroids. <laughs>